Hello and welcome back. Today I want to conclude the discussion about the RF Class D amplifier by building and testing the amplifier that we designed in a previous episode. So it's a voltage switching Class D amplifier with a T impedance matching network on the output and the power stage that should not work that well. So if you're curious about how this actually turns out, then keep watching. Now, there are quite a few things to look for in an amplifier. Today, I will be focusing on checking the overall efficiency and what is impacting it, but also have a look at how clean the output signal is and the overall frequency response of the amplifier. So are the filters doing a good job? So the board is already built, but before testing it, let's have a quick look at the schematic and PCB design. So there's not much difference in the final schematic compared to what we had in the simulation file. So I have the six logic gates in parallel. So this is the 74AC14 hex inverter. And other than this, we have the output filter. So the four reactive components. I've doubled the inductors because I was not sure if I want a surface mounted or through hold component. And for the capacitors, again, I'm using multiple components in parallel just to be able to get the precise values using standard components. Now, other than this, we have some SMA connectors both on the input and on the output. And for the input, I also did this one kilo ohm resistor just to set a reference low input value when there is no input signal present. Finally, the five volt supply is coming in through a filter. So we have a series ferrite bead and a set of capacitors before and after this on the one side to decouple the logic gate and on the other to prevent any sort of noise going back into the supply lines. If we now look at the board, so this is a two layer design, so there was no need for anything more complex. All of the components are flowing in a single line. So we have our supply here on the right side coming in through the first capacitors, the ferrite bead, and then the decoupling for the IC. And then our input signal is coming in through this left side SME connector and being routed into the six gates. So through this thin wire, we have the input signal. Through the thick wire, we have the output signal. Then this goes through the inductor, the various capacitors, the second inductor, and finally goes out through another SMA connector. Now the two inductors are placed at right angles, and this was intentional so that if the inductors are in a horizontal plane, then the two magnetic fields don't interact. And well, other than this, the other side is a full ground plane, so nothing interesting going on here. And while well, the whole board is a four by five centimeter design. So there was no need to make it any bigger than it, well, actually needs to be. Now for this design, I needed two inductors, a three microhenry and a 2.3 microhenry one. I built this by hand on some 3D printed cores, and this is what the final design looks like. I tried to keep the inductors as small as possible, so that they neatly fit onto the board. Now, I previously assembled this other board where both coils have the same wire thickness, so they're even smaller, but that presented some other interesting issues. We'll get to that in a minute. So, first things first, does the circuit actually work? To find out, I prepared a setup right here in which I have my amplifier circuit supplied from the power supply that's behind connected to the signal generator, which is set to output a five megahertz square wave. And then the output of the amplifier is going into a 20 decibel attenuator, terminated with a 50 ohm load, and going into the first channel of the oscilloscope. So if we turn things on, it works. So that's good. Now, other than just working, let's also check the efficiency now. So for that, I prepared this amp meter in series with the supply. We know the output is 50 ohms and we have the RMS voltage displayed by the oscilloscope. And well, the input supply voltage is 5.00 volts. And if we run the numbers, we're getting 84.9% of efficiency, which is decent, but we should be getting a bit more. So just to see what's going on, we can start looking into the circuit, specifically look at the square wave output of our amplifier. So if I make a single capture, maybe just remove the output signal. So we see our voltage square wave and we see a few things about it. 
So we nicely see the dip that's going on when peak current is being reached. So this is exactly like the simulation was telling us. If we use the cursors on the upper side, we can see that there's 680 millivolts of voltage difference between the high and low point. So if we consider the current to be 350 milliamps, as was in the simulator, this is equal to 1.94 ohms. If we look on the bottom side, we see a slightly smaller voltage drop, so only 440 millivolts, which corresponds to a series resistance of 1.25 ohms. So we have quite a lot of series resistance in the power transistors. Now, the other thing you may notice is this ringing appearing. So if we zoom in just a bit more, and we also bring in the cursors, we can see that this is happening at around 200 something megahertz. So this is a very high frequency ring that may or may not cause some other troubles as well. Now, one of the comments that I've gotten on the previous video was that when you're connecting multiple gates in parallel, one of the issues that you can run into is that the gates are not switching at the same time. So this will cause noise and efficiency problems. So one reason for this is the propagation delay that you get for the individual gates. So these have a specific tolerance and these can be different in between the gates in the same IC. And for the timing from the layout, well, you can take a bit of care. So not really do it like this. Right now you can see that my input signal is reaching this lower gate first. And then after various amounts of time, it reaches the other gates. So based on the trace length, the last gate is receiving the input signal roughly 100 to 200 picoseconds later than the first one. Similar story we have with the output traces. Now, of course, this sort of 100, 200 picosecond delay that we can get from this layout is more or less negligible compared to the nanoseconds of propagation delay from within the IC. Then you get tolerances in the input high and low thresholds, as well as the hysteresis value. So one of the things that you can do is have an arrangement like this. So where you use one gate to transform a relatively slow input signal into a very fast rising and falling edge. And then from this drive the various gates in parallel. So as you can see in this linear technology app note. So since I did not use this extra gate, I'm driving my circuit from the square wave generator. So not a sine wave. This way I have the very nice sharp edge, both rising and falling. So I should not have this issue. However, for this particular board, the ringing exists regardless of the number of gates. So here we can see the previous measurement where we have all six gates in parallel. So we see this ringing both on the rising and falling edge. I later measured the same thing with only four gates and well, it looks more or less the same. If we go down to one gate, well, we run into a current limit, but we almost can make out the ringing. However, if we leave a single gate with no output load, so no LC circuitry, we still see that a bit of ringing is occurring. So we don't have a flat direct transition from low to high. So in this case, most likely this ringing is occurring not necessarily because of the mismatch in the timing in between the gates, but rather because of the various parasitic elements in the layout and in the components. So various series inductances and parallel capacitances, which are resonating. Now, this is not to say that the gates are switching at the same time. They most definitely are not. But the mismatch in the timings is not of great concern to the efficiency and to the noise output of the circuit. So our actual efficiency and overall power output does not match the calculations and simulations. Because the series resistance in the switches is different. It's higher in the real world. So other than the switching power stage, is the amplifier losing power somewhere else? Well, this is where this other board comes into play. I've built this first and it's more or less the same as the second board with one major difference, the wire that is used in the inductors. So the first board is using thick wire, this one is using thin wire. So I left the circuit with the thin inductors running for about 10 minutes. And if we look at it using the thermal imaging camera, we can see that although the IC is heating up a bit, the hottest component by far is this central inductor. So even though both inductors are made from the same wire thickness, have roughly the same number of turns, so roughly the same series resistance, one of them is heating up way more than the other one. 
and it's also the hottest component on the board. So it has the highest contribution to the power loss and well, efficiency loss. Let's now investigate why this is happening in the circuit simulator. So for that, I have the simulation where we had the six logic gates in parallel and the various components from our circuit. So if we run the circuit and we look at the currents running through the two inductors and we zoom in a bit, so we can see that current through L5, so this first inductor is much, much higher than the current through the L6 second inductor. So this is occurring because the first inductor is part of the low impedance output of the amplifier, so the 7 ohm circuit, whereas the second inductor is part of the 50 ohm impedance final output of the amplifier. So because of the two impedances, we have two different currents. And well, if we just check the exact values, so we have about 260 RMS milliamps running through the first inductor and about 100 milliamps RMS running through the second inductor. So the currents are almost in a ratio of 1 to 3, which means that the power dissipation, if we consider the exact same series resistance, is in a ratio of 1 to 9. Point is that when you're building a power impedance matching circuit, you need to consider that some components will see higher currents than other components. So you might want to take measures to reduce the energy loss that is occurring through these components. So you can apply measures like using a thicker wire for your inductors. So on the second board, I built the first inductor with thicker wire. So on the first board, the wire thickness was 0.15 millimeters. On this one, it's 0.3 millimeters. If we run this board, so I already set it up, let it run for a while. And then we go and check it with the thermal camera. We can see that the first inductor is still heating up, but it's no longer the hottest component in the circuit. So the entire circuit is running a bit more efficiently since it's not generating so much heat. So when discussing an amplifier's efficiency, it's not just important to look at the heat wasted on the amplifying element, the transistors, it's also important to consider the reactive elements in the matching circuits. Since in the real world, these have non-negligible series resistance, which will cause heat dissipation. Now, moving on, it's time to verify how well the impedance matching circuit is working as a filter. So we've seen that it is matching impedance, it is providing an output sine wave at some decent power, but to get a clearer picture, let's now look at the bandwidth of this amplifier. So for that, I've connected the amplifier to the signal generator and the oscilloscope, and I put the oscilloscope into bow d plot mode. So first off, I will be performing a measurement from 3 MHz to 7 MHz, comparing the input to the output. So if we run the measurement, wait for it to finish. So we can see that there is a clear spike at 5 MHz, and the response is dropping off before and after that, and we can see the exact value, so going point by point, the peak response is at 5.05 MHz, and the bandwidth, the minus 3 decibel point in reference to this, is at about 4.6 MHz below, and about 5.37 MHz above. So we have quite a nice and tight bandwidth. But of course, we can get some more information about the response by looking at the wider frequency range. So now I set it to run from 500 kilohertz to 50 megahertz, just to see the attenuation in higher frequencies and to make sure that there's no hidden resonance or any unwanted behaviors appearing. So if we look at this plot, again we see our clear spike at 5 megahertz, and then we see the response nicely dropping off as frequency increases. So this is very similar to what we were getting in the circuit simulator. Finally, we need to look at how clean the amplifier output is when we're passing the 5 MHz signal through it. For that, I connected the amplifier to the spectrum analyzer and I will be inserting the signal from the signal generator again. And to make the first observation, I set the span between 1 MHz and 60 MHz just to see the fundamental and the first spikes in a clear fashion. So when we turn on the signal generator, we can clearly see our fundamental frequency and then the first few spikes. Now to get the exact value of these, I prepared some markers on them. And if we look at the marker table, we can see our fundamental 
at 5 MHz at about 24 dBm. And then the second and third spike, so at 10 and 15 MHz, have roughly the same amplitude, about minus 30, 31 dBm. So the amplitude difference between the fundamental and the highest spikes is about 55 dBm, similar to what the simulation was telling us. The main difference between this circuit and the simulated one being that the reactive components also have some series resistance. So when we perform the simulations, all of the components were ideal. Now, if you remember, when we were looking at the switching node of the amplifier, we noticed that other than the square wave that was supposed to be there, we also had a bit of high frequency ringing appearing. So next thing to check is how well does our filter filter that out. For that, we can change our frequency span from 60 MHz up to 600 MHz, and we can see our square wave harmonics dying down very clearly, so this is what we've seen before, but we can also notice a small spike appearing in the 3 to 400 megahertz range. Now we can make this noise a bit more visible if we change our bandwidth to a smaller value. So I set it to 3 kilohertz, it's taking forever to perform the measurement, but this way we see our high frequency ringing a bit more clearly. So it's on similar amplitude to our fifth harmonic. And we can also confirm this is coming from the amplifier by switching off our input signal. So by doing this, we can clearly see our switching spikes disappearing, but also the high frequency noise. So depending on how large the spike is, it may or may not cause a problem to you. If it is a problem, then you'll need to do something about it, either by improving the components in the output filter or adding some extra filtration elements or by providing a snubber circuit to prevent the ringing in the first place. Point is that when you're designing a switching circuit, it's important to understand that you don't just have your fundamental switching square wave and its upper harmonics, you can also get this sort of ringing appearing at very high frequency. So you need to look out for that as well. In the end, this little amplifier is working. It's not perfect, but the calculations did tell us that we should expect some issues. The main concern, the transistor's on resistance, is more or less close to the datasheet values, rather than what we used in our calculations. In general, you should design your amplifier to have the output load considerably larger than what the maximum switch resistance can be. This way, you will get the most reliable results. But anyway, regardless of calculations and simulations, it's always important to practically verify the circuit since you can get all sorts of unexpected behaviors and results. The ringing in the switching node did not appear in any of the simulations. So when building something, each step from theoretical design to practical testing is important. And with that said, hope you got some useful information after this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be updated to Tomek's videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.